This topic is about transitional metal complexes. Now, what is transition metals? Transition metals or transition elements are actually known as d-block elements from the periodic tables. And why do we call that as d-block elements? Because the electronic configurations involve 3D orbitals. Let's look at examples of uh, transition metals or d-block elements. So say, for example, I have iron Fe. So what is the proton number of Fe? 26. The electronic configurations will be argon, 18, 4s2, 20, and then 3d, 6. So because it involves 3d, so we call that as d-block elements. But d-block elements not necessarily a transition metals. Now what does that mean? Let's look at the definitions of transition elements or transition metals. It is actually one that can form at least one or more stable ions with incomplete d orbitals. What does that mean by incomplete d orbitals? Take this at the same example, iron. What are the common ions for iron? So common ion formed by iron would be Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus. Let's look at new configurations once they form ions. So 2 plus means it is argon by removing 4s, so now left 3d6. Same goes to Fe3 plus. Argon is still there. And then no more 4s, we have 3d5. So again, look at the d orbitals. It's actually partially filled. So when they're able to form at least one ion with partially filled or incomplete d orbitals, we call that as a transition metal. Let's take another elements from the D blocks, but they are not a transition metals. Example, we have um, scandium. The proton number for scandium is 21. The configurations will be argon, 4s2, 20, and then 3d1. It's still a d block because it involves 3d orbitals but if once they change into ions what is the common ions for scandium only one which is scandium 3 plus and then the configurations will be argon 4s 0 3d 0 so which means they have empty d orbitals so this one is not considered as a transition metal. It is just a d-block element. All right, let's look at another example. Let's say we have zinc. Zinc proton number is 3,0. Configuration is argon, 4s2 is 20. So 3d, 10. All right, so the common ions for Zinc will be 2 plus. Zinc 2 plus. That's the only ions formed by zinc. So the configuration will be argon 4s 0 3d 10. Again, the d orbitals is not empty but it's fully filled. So in order to be a transition metals or transition elements, the d orbital has to be partially filled. It can be from one electron all the way up to nine electrons. So it cannot be 0 or 10. So zinc, also another element, is a d-block, but it's not considered as a transition metal. All right, so that's the definitions of transition metal. Same goes to other periods. Now let's look at these slides again. We focus on a graph. Let's look at um, the first graph, where they actually focusing on atomic radius. Now, look at the trends. We must be able to explain the general trend of the atomic radius for the transition metals. And then we focus on scandium again. The easiest one. Okay, so it looks like the trend from scandium all the way decreased until nickel and then slightly increased to copper and zinc. So why is it decreasing in terms of atomic radius for the transition metals? Now, it's very simple because they are moving across a period. Again, the same thing, which is about the core charge. So across a period, the core charge is increasing, but the shielding effects remain constant. All right. So all the way decrease from scandium to nickel. 
but why from nickel it increases to copper and zinc? Now, this is due to the 3D electrons. Now, for example, we look at um, copper. Copper configuration is 29. So you have argon, 4s2, 3d10. Sorry, it's 4s1. Supposed to be 4s1, 3d10. All right. Now, if you realize that the 3d orbitals now is actually from the inner orbitals, it's not the outer. So when it is an inner orbitals, it's actually contribute to the shooting effect. So when you move across a period from scandium all the way to zinc, we notice that the number of electrons in the d orbitals is actually increasing. And the d orbitals is actually not the outer orbitals, but the inner. So that is why when you move across a period, the shooting effect is actually increasing instead of staying constant. So what will happen is at the end until nickel. And then it start the shooting effect, it starts overcoming the core charge. Therefore, from nickel to copper, it actually increases and then all the way to zinc. So that is why it decreases at first and then increases at the end. All right. Now let's look at the uh, electronegativity. Again, what is electronegativity? Electronegativity is the tendency to accept an electrons. All right. So moving across a period, the tendency to pull electron is fully based on the core charge. All right. So the general trend is increasing because core charge is increasing. But at the end, if you realize, look at the graph, at the end, it happened to decrease. Why it happened to decrease? Because again, the same thing, the d orbitals with more and more electrons and hence contribute to a higher shielding effect. When you have higher shielding effect, the electronegativity will tend to decrease because the attraction towards electrons becomes weaker. All right, now let's look at first ionization energy. First ionization energy or ionization energy. What is the definition again? Energy required to remove and electrons from one more of gaseous atom to form one more of gaseous cation. Understand the conditions. Again, if you look at the general trend, it's actually increasing all the way. Now, why is it increasing all the way? Because the core charge is increasing. All right. So more energy actually needed to remove electrons from the elements. And of course, in between, you can see some of the elements actually relatively constant and some of it is actually decreased. For example, if you look at this part, this is constant, and then from palladium to copper is to silver is actually decreasing. Now, why is it decreasing and why is it saying constant? The same reason. Core charge is increasing, but at the same time, 3D electron is getting higher. So shooting effect is slightly increasing. So that affects the overall trend. But we don't have to explain in details. Just bear in mind that the overall trend for this. It's just core charge increases. That's why generally it's increased. But at the end, some of it would decrease. This actually due to the D electrons and contribute higher shooting effect. Okay, last one. Let's look at the uh, density. Now the density, what is the formula for density? It's actually mass over volume. All right. So when you move across a period due to increasing core charge, due to um, decreasing atomic radius, the volume of the atoms will be smaller, but the mass is increasing because proton number increase. So when mass increase, volume decrease, overall density will tend to in increase. All right. But at the end, if you look at a graph again, it tends to decrease at the last few elements. Why is it decreasing again? Same reason, because shooting if I increase, that will make the atomic radius to increase. When the atomic radius increase means the volume will be slightly bigger. If the volume is slightly bigger, then, which means the density will increase slightly. All right, sorry, the density will decrease slightly because the volume is getting bigger now, all right? 
So yeah, that's the that's about it. The general properties for the transition elements. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Now, transition elements, I think all of you or most of you actually learn this. Transition elements will have three main characteristics. All right, so they can form ions with multiple oxidation states, they can form colored compounds, they can act as a catalyst. Now, these are the three main characteristics. Now, we're going to discuss it one by one. First, we're going to look at multiple oxidation states. Now, transition elements exhibit multiple oxidation numbers of differing stability. So, which means, like for example, iron. Iron can be 2 plus, iron can be 3 plus, copper can be plus, copper can be 2 plus. Why they can actually achieve different oxidation state? While well, group 1 and 2, they only have a fixed oxidation numbers. For example, group 1 metals can only form plus 1. Group 2 metals can only form plus 2. But for transition metals, they're able to form more than one charge. Now, this is because the 3D orbitals having an energy value close to that of 4S. All right, so it is easy or it will have the same amount of energy being released or gained in order to lose electrons from both 3D and 4S. Like what we learned before, both 3D and 4S are actually considered as the valence electrons. So let's look at example. For example, copper. Copper configuration is supposed to be argon, 3D10, 4S1. All right. So if you look at copper, where is the valence shells and what is the number of valence electrons? It's actually both 4S and 3, 3D. So the total valence electron here is 10. All right. So what does that mean? If you have 10 valence electrons, copper can actually form from copper plus all the way until copper 10 plus theoretically all right but of course it's based on the stability so in order to form plus or in order to form 10 plus it depends on the energy required so if you want to form 10 plus which means you need to remove all 10 valence electrons and with considering the uh, core charge if you remove all valence electrons that will be difficult so the energy value is too high so what are the common ions formed by copper is actually just copper plus and copper 2 plus. If you look at a configuration for copper plus, it's actually argon 3D 10 by just removing the 4S orbitals. All right. If you look at copper 2 plus, then it's argon 3D 9. Now, if I ask you a question here, between copper plus and copper 2 plus, which one is more stable? Definitely. Copper plus. All right. Why is it copper plus? Because it just removed the 4s and it maintained the fully filled d orbitals. But for copper 2 plus, it is actually forming a 3d9. Now, by removing one electron from 3d10, is very difficult and the energy needed will be very high. All right. So this is how we compare the stability. Now, let's look at another example. Let's say we have uh, iron. Again, all right. So, what is the uh, sorry? What is the configurations of iron? Let's say iron supposed to be argon three D four S two first. Don't forget, and then three D six because twenty six. Now, what is the valence electron here? Total eight valence electrons. Okay, so which means. Theoretically, iron can form from plus all the way up to A plus. Again, uh, theoretically, okay, in order to remove all eight electrons, you need a really high uh, energy, so which is impossible. So what are the common ion formed by iron? It can be iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus, which means these are the ions that give you a reasonable stability. Okay, so let's look at the configuration. If it is 2 plus, that will be argon. 3d6 you remove just the outer orbital 4s2 and 3 plus is just argon 3d5 now if you still remember when the d orbitals is half filled it's actually more stable all right so in this case between 2 plus and 3 plus 3 plus is the one that give you higher stability all right so this is how they actually form multiple oxidation state due to 
the similar energy value between 3D and 4S. So both considered as a valence shell, they can easily lose any electrons from both 4S and 3D. So that will be the answer if they ask why. Okay, if a question asks why uh, they can form multiple oxidations, that will be the answer given, right? So let's look at next one, colored compound. Now, these are the common colors you can see from all the transition metals. Titanium is purple, vanadium can be purple, green, blue, yellow. So all these different, different colors. Now, what makes them show color? All right, what makes them show color? So let's look at what we call transition metal complexes. Okay, this transition metal complexes is the one that sh making the compound colored. Okay, so what is the definition for transition metal complexes and how they form this metal complexes? Transition metal complexes form when transition metal ions bonded with ligands through dative covalent bonds. Now, I hope you guys still remember what is a dative covalent bonds. So it's like a donor of a pair of electrons to form a covalent bond with an ions. All right. Now, in this case, it must be a transition metal ions. And then ligand can be anything with lone pairs of electrons. They can be one pair, two pair, at least one pair of electrons so that they can form a dative covalent bonds. All right. Just like whatever illustrated in the, in the diagrams, we have the M here, which is the metal. And all these alphabet L is actually indicating the ligands. So all these are actually dative covalent bond. So total, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six dative covalent bonds here. And this L indicates ligand. All right. Move on. Now, I just said that the definition for ligand is supposed to have a lone pair of electrons so they can form a dative covalent bond with the central metal or the transition metal ions. Examples of ligand like water, because you have two lone pairs. Hydroxide, three lone pairs. Ammonia, one lone pair still counted, cyanide, halite ion, of course, because all with three lone pairs, carbonyl, nitrosyl. These are the common ligands that we can get. All right, common ligands that we can get. Now, types of ligands. It's actually categorized into three different categories. All right, we have monodentate ligands. We have bidentate. We have polydentate. Now, one by one, okay? Let's look at the example given for monodentate ligands. We have ammonia, we have chloride, we have H2O. Now, what is that monodentate ligands? Mono means one. One means each ligand here can only form one dative bond with the transition metal ions. Now, don't be confused between one dative bonds and one lone pair. Now, for example, I have ammonia here. How many lone pairs we have? We have one lone pairs. All right. For chloride, we have how many lone pairs? Four lone pairs. All right. For water, we have two lone pairs. Now, it doesn't matter how many lone pairs a, a ligand has. All right. So we just look at how many atoms in the ligand actually consist of lone pairs. Now, come back to ammonia. We have N and H. Which atom here actually with lone pair and how many of them? We only have nitrogen with lone pairs. So if you have one atom with lone pair, then you only can form one dative covalent bonds. All right. Chlorides. How many atoms? You only have one atom. So chloride is the only one. And again, it's monodentate. You only can form one dative covalent bond. Water. You have H and Oxygen, which atom here actually with lone pairs? I only have oxygen atom with lone pairs. So they only can form one dative covalent bond with the transition metal ions. All right. Now, let's look at bidentate. All right. So look at bidentate here. Now, this is one full ligand. How many atoms here actually with lone pair? We have two N. So these two N can form how many dative bonds? Yes. Two dative bonds. That's why we call it as a bi, bidentate, because of two. All right. Another example here. Now, let's say oxalate ions. Look at this. How many atoms with lone pairs? By right, it should be one, two, 
three, four. Okay, but these two are actually stable. Look at that. The oxygen here and here both are actually forming double bonds. So they are stable without the negative charge. These two, the one that highlighted in blue, are the one that are actually contributing the negative charge. So which means they have extra electrons. Look at that. You have two pairs here, but the blue one has three pairs. So you have through oxygen atoms actually readily donate the lone pair to form additive covalent bonds. Same, you have two means by dentate ligand. All right, so let's look at polydentate ligands. Polydentate means more than two. All right, we don't, we don't name them one by one, it's just more than two. So look at the examples given here. We have how many atoms actually with lone pairs and readily donate, donates the lone pairs. We have one here, two, three, four, five, and six. So we have six. All right, so that's why they call it as a polydentate ligand. One single ligand, one single molecule of this thing, able to form six dative covalent bond with the metal ions, with the transition metal. Okay, let's look at another one, last one. This one, we have three oxygen atoms that readily donate its lone pair to form a dative bonds. All right, so in this case, again, it formed more than two, so we still call it as a polydentate ligands. Now, as a conclusion, types of ligand, we have mono, bi, and polydentate. Now, how to differentiate them? We just look at the number of atoms in the ligand that consists of lone pair, not the number of lone pairs. Okay, clear? All right. Now, these are the examples of mono, bi, and polydentates. If you can see from here, let's look at the first diagrams. Now we have the blue and the green, of course, uh, they are both different ligands. So we have nitrogen here, we have chlorine here. Again, look at this, this is one ligand, all right, this is one ligand, and they are forming only one dative bond. So this ligand known as a monodentate. Same goes to the chlorine also forming one dative bond, so this is a monodentate, all right? But if you look at, the bidentate ligands, okay? Now, these two are actually connected. See that? There's a bridge here, the orange bridge. This is actually a bond. So these two are actually bonded together. So this whole thing considered as one ligand. And this one ligand actually forming how many DD bonds? One and two. That's why they call it as a bidentate. All right, now look at the last one. This is a polydentate. Now obviously, the orange one are actually connecting all the ligands. Now we have how many ligands here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now all six are actually connected with the orange line, which is the covalent bond. So which means all these six are considered as one ligand. Okay, just one ligand. But this one ligand actually forming how many daily bonds? One, two, three, four, five, and six. So six data bonds from one single ligand, and that's how we call it as a polydentate ligand. All right? Now, i show you another example here. Let's say I have a copper. Two plus. It is a transition metals because this ion is actually having a partially filled or incomplete D orbitals. Okay, if you still remember. And when this copper ion actually dissolve in water, they are actually connecting with water molecules. Now, don't forget water also consists of lone pairs. And of course, water only with oxygen consists of lone pair. So this is actually considered as a monodentate ligand. All right, monodentate ligand. Now, how does it work? Now, each oxygen here has two lone pairs. Again, it doesn't matter how many lone pairs, as long as you have one atom with lone pairs. So they readily donate one lone pair to form a bond with copper. Same goes to this, same goes to this, same goes to this, and the rest. Okay, so 
how many ligands we have seen since the monodentate we have six water here so six water we have six ligands and six ligands we have six dative covalent bond now if you still remember the molecular shapes what happened what is the shape of these complex ions we have six bonds so it's actually forming octahedral okay now hopefully still, you still remember about the bond angles so what is the bond angle between them all 90 degree all right so that's how a complex ion form okay sorry let's look at the naming of complex ions okay i think the video is too long so let's just stop here let's continue with another video